Good morning, First Church. I'm Candace Fowler. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is great to be with you. You know, one of the things is about our large congregation, we have four services, and it's hard. Like, if we tried to catch every special occasion that happened here, it would be hard to do that. But sometimes there are things that we just have to make mention of. And yesterday, the New Orleans Saints signed uh, Blake Groupie, and his parents are here today, and he's one of ours. So uh, we're pretty excited about that and want to wish him congratulations. And, and, and if, you, if you see a family just kind of floats out of here today, that's the groupies. And we're just as proud with them. And so we do celebrate those accomplishments and so proud of Blake. And So anyway, we're going to talk about faith over fear. And this is our third week of that series. And we're excited to be a part and learning more from God and who we are in God. And, and so it's sometimes hard, though, to know what faith looks like in the midst of fear. So today I brought a couple of different photos to show you that I think might help exhibit what faith in the midst of fear looks like. So these two are pictures of me on a roof, and I'm roofing, and um, I don't particularly like heights. But the faith is not on my part. It's on the part of the homeowner thinking I could actually roof a house. So uh, I was on a mission trip, and those are not those are not staged. I really did get up there and nail in those shingles. So uh, the next one, Faith Over Fear. These are my two youngest boys. The littlest one in the back has a diaper on if that tells you their ages. And to just give you some scale, let's pull out from that picture. <laughs> that is a 10-foot ceiling. And then the upper, it overlooks, the second floor looks, over, and that's an 18-foot ceiling. And I stopped them mid-climb. And um, I said, you better get down here. But of course, like, first let me take your picture. So, uh, (laughs) but faith over fear. They had no fear. um, And I was a little frightened. But they just lived in the faith that they could get up there and scale the outside of those stairs. And so we're going to be looking at this in Acts for the next few weeks. And we're actually going to go through Acts for the entire year. And we're going to look today about having faith in the midst of the unknown. And we're going to be walking through the entire book. So bring your Bibles. Let's open those up together. And you can put a bookmarker in it, and you'll know right where to go to for next week, because next week we'll be in chapter 4. But would you pray with me this morning before we go any further? Lord God, we are thankful that you are so faithful to us. And Lord, help us to learn from you to how to have faith and trust in you, Lord, in the midst of things that are fearful and unknown in our lives. Lord, today would you speak through me and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart bring glory and honor to you in this day. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're going to just jump jump right in. Chapter 3, verse 1 of Acts. It says, One day, Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now a man who had been lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put up every day to beg from those going to the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money, and Peter looked straight at him as John did, and then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong, and he jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. And then he went with them to the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And as they were filled with the wonder and amazement of what had happened to him, and while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us us, as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. 
You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. And by faith in the name of Jesus Christ, this man whom you see, you know, was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he has been foretold through the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come to you from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed to you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he has promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and the covenant that God has made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all people on earth will be blessed. And when God raised up his servant, he sent him to you, first to you, to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So a few weeks ago, I took a retreat. I went to the Lake of the Ozarks uh, at an Airbnb on mile marker two, if you know the lake region. I stay in an Airbnb that has a a screened-in deck that's probably from the edge of those steps to the edge of those steps. The bedroom I sleep in has a sliding glass door, and it opens up to the deck and I leave my door open at night and I can hear all the sounds of the lake, the water and the boats and the birds and the geese and it's just a time of resting and and I go and I usually just take a nap the very first thing. I don't make phone calls. I try to have it just be as quiet as possible. Um, I read some books. I take my Bible and just spend time in just silence. Now I decided to do this because I listened to the sages of old those people who had been down this journey further than I had, and they said you need to take a couple of times a year to restore and rest. So that's what I have tried to do. And I started doing this in seminary where I wrote a rule of life. Now, my rule of life has different things on it that change, but the two things that consistently stay on my rule of life are these two things. One, make my bed every day, and two, retreat two times a year. And so I was on this retreat. Um, it's not like a vacation. It's just a time I just sit in silence a lot and just listen. It's a quiet time. And uh, most recently, as I was studying, I was just listening and going through the pages of Scripture just to listen to the book of Acts. Not as just for studying to preach, but to really listen and just see what I could learn just from the bigger picture of Acts. So I'm reading along and I'm thinking, okay, God, what do you want me to learn from this? Where do I see faith in this book? And so I look at this and I think, okay, we see this man who is begging outside of the temple gates. And we know that he is there because of the piety or the religious traditions of the Jews. Now, the religious, the Jews were known to be very generous people because of their piety or their religious convictions. So the, the people begging knew that they could get food or clothing or money by sitting outside the temple courts. But here's something interesting. Do you know that Christians are not necessarily known to be generous people? especially when it comes to tipping after a meal. So I thought, I'm going to look this up and see if this is really accurate. I thought, see if I'm going to find any studies. The most recent study was done in 2010 at Cornell University. And they did a study of who is the best tipper, and this is what was shown. Was that most, uh, the average Christian will tip between about 17.3%, That's between the 15 to 20% range of what is given typically. But um, that many, uh, let's see, 13% of Christian diners left less than a 15%, which is double the percentage of those unaffiliated with any other religious organization. So while it's statistically false to say that Christians are bad tippers, 
it is true that Christians are more likely to stiff their servers. That's not a very good reputation. That's not a very good perception. Even if the statistics aren't true, that's not a great way to, for us to be perceived. So I'm going to encourage you all to change that. To show yourself as Christians in, um, in the community when you're tipping and then um, change that perception of what Christians are like. Be, let us Help us to be known as generous people. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled sermon. All right, so this man is sitting outside the temple. He's waiting for money and alms, uh, food or whatever he can get for support of um, himself because he can't walk. Up walks Peter and John. And Peter says to him, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I can do for you, I can do for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Walk. And then taking his hand, it says they pick, help him up, lean down, help him up, and he stands. Now, it is amazing because it says he goes off worshiping and praising God. But I just have to wonder, in that split second between the time he says, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'm going to pray for you, I wonder if this man just kind of thinks great. How is that going to help me today? But it does change that day. Something changes drastically in that man's life. And this is what Peter said. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he tells him to walk. Now when we hear people say, I do this in the name of you know, the, the people. I do this in the name of justice. We understand what that it means. And, and what that does mean is that they're taking on the authority of that person to speak in that situation. And so what we see, though, we see this also being done in Scripture. And so we have to ask, does this mean the same thing to say it's being done in the name of Jesus Christ? Well, the first time we see this done is in Genesis 4. And it says, Seth also had a son, and his name was Enosh. And at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Now, to give a little family tree history there, we have Adam and Eve, the first humans. They had three sons, Cain, Abel, and Seth. And Seth has a son named Enosh. So Enosh is just two generations away from the beginning of all humanity. And Enosh's name means fragile, mortal, or meaning that he was unable to do things on his own, which was set by an example by his grandparents when they tried to do it on their own. So Enosh comes along, and in his fragility, people start calling on the name of the Lord for help. Then last week, Acts chapter 2, we read that said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In Psalms 86, we see that, Lord, you are good and forgiving, full of mercy for those who call out to you or call on your name. Now, as Methodists, there are some things that we believe, and we believe in the process of sanctification, and that means of salvation. And we believe that we are saved from our sins when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord. We believe that we are saved from death, um, uh, eternal death. And we are saved, therefore, to live in heaven and eternity with Jesus forever. But right in the middle, we also have a lot of saving going on. We are saved from ourselves. We are saved from our anger. We are saved from our jealousy. We are saved from our um, sins, our burdens, our depression, our anxiety, all those things. God continues to sanctify us and save us all throughout our life. And when we pray that prayer, our kingdom come, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are asking for that sanctification process to happen through us so that we can bring God's healing into the world. And so when we call on the name of the Lord, we are saved. And this story, we see that they're calling on the name of Jesus, and we see that this man is physically healed. Now, we, have, we do see witness to healing on this earth. We've either experienced in our own life or we've heard about it or we know someone who God has healed. And I'm not saying that healing doesn't take place when we call on God's name. But what I want us to see is that when we call on the name of the Lord, we have access to all of the riches of who God is. Now, the riches might include that we're saved from our sickness 
or our bankruptcy or that we aren't get caught don't we get that we don't get caught cheating or lying or maybe when we see red lights behind us we don't get caught with a ticket and i've prayed that prayer too i just usually hope i'm driving so fast they can't catch me when they realize i'm speeding not it's not true is it <laughs> we've got a few officers in the room <laughs> But the riches of God are truly things like mercy and peace and forgiveness. And when God takes the burdens and the heaviness of our heart, those are the riches that are afforded to us when we say yes to Jesus and we call on God's name. Now, I shared with this with you uh, before, but maybe not in this fullest extent. But two years ago in May, I lost my dad, and he had been, had been declining for some time, and they put him on hospice, and he died within about two weeks. And then last year in June, my mom died. So my mom and dad died within 13 months of each other. Now, my mom's death was unexpected, and she was 85, but when I say unexpected is we didn't know anything was wrong. I got a phone call on a Saturday night about 7 o'clock from the nursing home, and she died by 6 o'clock the next morning. So it was unexpected. Now, I grieved for my mom, and I still miss my mom, but I'll be very honest with you. It was hard to be my mother's daughter. There was a lot of pressure, and probably, if, as I look back now as an adult, probably some mental health things going on with my mom that made it feel like our relationship was always a struggle. And things that she said, um, even though I knew she loved me with her whole heart, things that she said that, you know, still, I can still hear in my head. You probably know what those things are like. And so at the end of the day when she died, I went out to the backyard and there was this beautiful sunset. I even had people texting me saying, hey, look at this sunset. I'm thinking of you. And, and I looked at that sunset and I was like, God, I, I can't carry this feeling my whole life. And it wasn't so much the grief of losing my mom, but it was that understanding that there was no way I could ever make that relationship right with my mom because she was gone. And it was this dread and grief and pain. And I was like, God, I can't carry this my whole life. And in that moment, I know God took that from me. Those were God's riches. It didn't change the fact my mom had died, but in those moments, I, was, I had a, was able to grab hold of God's riches for my life in the fact that God took away that pain and anguish and regret. And this week, I continued to see God doing things in my life. And in the essence of time, I'm just going to give you the high points, but... At the end of that week that I took at, in the uh, retreat, on that Thursday, I went to a meeting at the conference office for the United Methodist in Missouri. My Pastor Christopher and I went, and we met other pastors and clergy from the area. And there was a speaker, a pastor from Florida, sharing about what's called fresh expressions in the Methodist church, where Methodist churches are seeing opportunities to go into the community and start a, an experience with God in, a, in the community, like going to a dog park or going to having a Bible study with um, moms and dads who are waiting for their kids during softball or baseball practice, or they're going to a Mexican restaurant and having Bibles and burritos, or they're even going to a coffee shop or a brewery, and they're taking this movement into the world and seeing God move in those places. And so I kept hearing about that that day, and I just, I was like, Lord, would you raise up someone to do a fresh expression through First Church? So we go, that's Thursday, I come to Sunday, a, a woman from our church comes and speaks to me on Sunday, said, hey, I need a few minutes of your time, and I said, hey, come on by on Tuesday. So Tuesday morning, we always have staff meeting here. I got out of staff meeting, and then a member of our green team came, came by and caught me. We had some conversation, and she said, hey, Candace, would you please pray that God would send more people to our green team, the ones who take care of all these flowers. We're, we're needing a few more members. And I was like, absolutely. Now, one of the things I've asked God to do is when I say I will pray for someone, I've asked God, would, they, would God accept that as a prayer? Because most often I'll go back and pray for that same thing, but I don't want to for, ever forget. And so I just said, God, when I say yes, will you take that as my prayer? I'm calling your name. That conversation took place. 
I go to meet with the woman who caught me on Sunday morning, and she starts talking to me, and she said, you know, Candace, a few weeks ago we met about an opportunity, and I said no. I said I would support it with my time. I'd support it with my tithing, my offering, but I did not want to head this up. But she said, but God started talking to me. And she pulled out the Missouri Methodist uh, magazine. And she says, in this magazine, I've been reading about some churches who are doing things like going to Mexican restaurants and coffee shops and doing something in the community. And I was wondering if maybe we could do something like that. And my eyes are like this big. And I'm just tearful. And I look at her and she's, she can tell like I'm having a moment. And I said, I have been praying that God would raise up something, someone like this to do something. And she just puts her head down on the table, and then she looks at me, and she said, isn't God good? And so we celebrated and talked about how God was moving in her life and how God had prompted me to be praying for that and how God brought us together. And so we had some conversation, and then she leaves, and about the moment she leaves, a family comes into the church, and I'm meeting with them about church membership. And, and while we're talking, and she said, hey, I was thinking, um, tell me about the ministries here at First Church. And so we're talking about it. And honestly, I don't even mention the green team, but her daughter speaks up and says, I was wondering, do you think I could work with the plants and the people here who are on that green team? I was like, of course you can. And so I leave that meeting, and I walk back to our staff offices, and I'm like, people, you need to be praying today because Jesus is saying yes, left and right. But it is so exciting to see God moving as people were calling on the name of Jesus, and for the glory of God, they were saying yes. And when they call on the name of Jesus for fulfilling what God is calling them to do, we experience the riches of God. And when we call on the name of Jesus, we invoke the Holy Spirit to move within each of us and start moving in this world so that we can do what God is calling us to do in this world and bring the riches of God to the world through us. And in Philippians chapter 2, we read this. Therefore, God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave Jesus the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, friends, I am your pastor, and I is the best thing I've ever done. But do you also know that I'm just also a 50-year-old <clears throat> woman and, um, and a married and I have struggles in my marriage, and I have kids, and we have five children, and nearly every single day I go to bed and I think, well, I probably messed it up with that one. I wish I had done this sooner. I wish I'd been doing that when they were little. I've dropped the ball. I'm probably the worst mom ever. And with my husband, I love him, and he loves me. But man, this week, I said, we were having a conversation. At one point, I said, I don't want to argue with you. And he said, okay. But I thought, I really do want to argue with you. I'm just learning with you all. And we're learning together that in the midst of the unknown, we can have faith in the midst of our fears of the unknown. And it can happen when we just simply say, Jesus. Because unlike the person who says, I'm coming in the name of the president or the king, or I'm coming in the name of, of the, for the power of the people, that power is relegated to that moment. But when we call on the name of Jesus, we are calling on the Holy Spirit of the Most High God who is living and reigning today. And when we say Jesus, we call on a power that is outside of ourselves but also reigns within us. And it helps us carry those moments when we can't carry them ourselves, when the grief and the unknown is so heavy. And when the anxiety and the fear is overwhelming, but we can have faith. And at the end of the day, I'm going to share this song with you during our prayer time. And it's called More Than Able. And it's by Elevation Worship. And the words say this. When did I start to forget all of the great things you did? 
When did I throw away faith for the impossible? How did I start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me? And why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? And the chorus says, you are more than able. So today we're going to close with this prayer that we're going to pray each week through this series. It's a prayer that calls. It's a, I hope that you can make it a prayer of your own and not just on the weekend during worship. But then at the time of prayer we'll have at the end, I invite you to come pray. We're welcome to, um, We're here to pray with you today or just celebrate with you. But as we walk together and walk in the name of Jesus, not with fear, but with faith. So would you join me in this prayer today? Dear God, when we doubt, give us belief. When we are indifferent, give us compassion. Give us grace over hostility and hope over despair. And most of all, give us faith over fear. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you have a prayer concern today, we'd be honored to pray with you. You may come now.